Welcome back, Richard. It's good to see you for this midweek podcast. Right, right. Flying into July, right? That's right. We're already a few days in, um, and we have a great um, topic for today. It is um, one of the list our listeners wrote in and asked us a, a question, and um, it, it's it's a great question because you know I, I think I wish we could go, could go back and like look at patterns because it seems as though. Whenever a, a new program or new show comes out, um, you know, then all of a sudden you start hearing about uh, different disorders and different things. And, you know, a few years ago, a, a program came out on um, one of the Discovery Channels or Lifetime Channels or something like that about hoarding. And now mm -hmm. everyone who has a bunch of stuff in their house, you know, they say, I'm a hoarder or my mom's a hoarder or my, my dad's a hoarder. And so um, we a listener wrote in and was asking about the difference between hoarding and just clutter. You know, if you have a bunch of stuff, does that mean that you're a hoarder or, you know, and, and why do we do it? Why do we hold on to things and, and keep things that, you know, we don't really need? Bernie, I don't know about you, but um, well, not everybody I know is, is, is living in a cluttered place, but a lot of people just have too much stuff. People right. complain about it all the time. Now, not everybody does. I have a few friends that I have. I walk into their houses. They're sort of minimalist. You know, they don't have a lot of stuff. But man, these Amazon trucks and Amazon boxes, and you look at porches, and there's always boxes on the porch, and well, people complain Richard, about oh. the The whole, like, advent of, like, when I was growing up, I don't remember storage units. <laughs> I don't remember there being... You know, and, and right. now here in here in our, our town, they there are storage units going up everywhere. And and what that means to me is that people have a whole lot of stuff that they don't even keep in their house. You know, it's not even stuff that they're using very often. And I can rec I can acknowledge some things. You know, maybe you live in a place where you can't you know keep your boat or something like that, or you're not allowed to have a shed because of the homeowners association or something. So you you have to put some things. I, I get some of that, but my goodness, they are storage units are going up everywhere you know i the the story that i always tell is when i went to college and it was right after the civil war and when we went to college we lived in these little dorm rooms and i had all not i everybody had a you know five or six shirts and a few pairs of pants and two or three pairs of shoes we could carry everything in a suitcase or two back and forth you know now you have to have a u-haul when i took my kids to their college dorms i had to have a u-haul to carry all the stuff okay so we just have more stuff and this is funny this woman it's summer people are going on summer vacation and the woman who wrote in the caller um she wrote in and said i went to visit my cousin <laughs> she was astonished at the amount of stuff in the and she said none of it was organized there were food bags and wrappers all over the place empty pizza boxes clothes and everything just seemed to be in piles everywhere she said there wasn't a surface there wasn't a space a flat surface that they could put a plate on to eat a meal because everything was covered with stuff okay and she came back and she said is 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 she becoming a hoarder what she wanted to know with the question she asked is is my, I think it was her cousin. She said, is my cousin, is is she a hoarder or is this just a lot of clutter? Mm -hmm. And should I be worried about her? Okay. Mm -hmm. And the other thing um, she had was, the other thing she noted was that the animals running around in this place, and I, I think it was a couple of dogs and a cat, they seemed to have equal status as the humans. You know, they ate food off the, the animals would reach up and take by eat food off the table and they were just always in the way they were always around you know and 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 so they're kind of it, it made when she was telling the story it made me think of a medieval castle where they they shared the animals lived among the humans that's why they were that's why they didn't have trouble with smallpox um because animals lived with humans and they would eat at the table and that sort of thing and i thought about oh it's a little bit like a, a little bit like a medieval castle that you share with your animals so so it's a really good question. Is it hoarding? Is it this uh, diagnosable condition? Or is this just too much clutter? Right. Okay. So so if we talk a little bit then about what, what hoarding is, 
Um, you know, it's it's a it's a complicated psychological condition, like most mental health conditions. Um, but it's really the the persistent. I think the DSM five kind of describes it as this persistent difficulty with uh, separating or discarding or parting with possessions. Re really, regardless of their actual value, it doesn't matter how important they are as much as it is just I need to hold on to it. I need to keep it. I don't. They don't throw anything away. They don't get rid of anything. And this accumulation of stuff gets to the point where living conditions become unstable. And so, yeah, I, I recently had someone that I was working with who who described a, a relative who has so many things in their house that, um, you know, there are just these paths that go through. And um, the problem uh, arose because there was a leak and they didn't know that there was a leak because there was so much stuff accumulated that things began to get soaked and suddenly there's black mold and there's all of this stuff in the house that didn't, nobody knows how long it was there, um, mm -hmm. but it was, it was there. That's the kind of thing. These living spaces are now becoming unstable and unhealthy and problematic. And, and that helps us know that we're moving into this direction of a, of a hoarding disorder. Right. You know, and, and DSM, the way DSM defines this is, it's a persistent difficulty in discarding or parting with possessions. I think today in with, and I, I, I say Amazon, but at FedEx and UPS and right. Amazon, all these delivery systems. Um, I think there's also this almost a, an obsessive need to accumulate stuff. Um, I, I watch friends and family members and they're buying and buying and buying, oh, look at these shorts and look at this pair of shorts. Well, you've got 25 pairs of shorts. Yeah, this is cute and it's nice and it absorbs the water and it dries quickly when you're swimming. But do you really need 25 pair? Do you really need 50 t-shirts? Well, yeah, yeah, but this is really cute. And so there is this, I don't want to overstate it, pathological need, but there is an obsess obsession with acquiring stuff. Right. You know, because I don't, I'm not, I don't spend a lot of time on the computer and I spend even less time on Amazon and shopping sites. But I do occasionally, and I can see why the attraction, mm -hmm. because you're constantly being fed, hey, what about this? And what about this? And you wanted this and you wanted that. People like you also purchase this. So you're constantly being sold, marketed these products. So I understand that everything looks attractive. So I think it's the, the acquisition and combined with the difficulty discarding. So you have this accumulation of stuff that then becomes overwhelming. Right. Now, what... Certainly, um, as is the case, again, with, with all mm -hmm. the self-diagnosed uh, conditions, um, because people come in and talk about being a hoarder, that they have a relative that's a hoarder all the time, um, the, the actual prevalence is about 2 to 6%, which, which, is, which is much higher th than some other things, like you know, bipolar disorder, for example. You know, people will come in and say they have mood swings, they must have bipolar disorder, and that's like 1% to 2% of the population. The prevalence here is about two to six percent of the population, and, and it's there's a relatively high comorbidity rate with right. things like anxiety disorders and and mood related disorders and things like that. So so we we recognize that the prevalence is a little bit higher than some other things, right. but if we look back and 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 kind of analyze the the population, we also see some patterns that help make it a little bit more understandable. So for example, uh, adults over the age of 55 or so are especially vulnerable. Well, you know, if, if you are a kid growing up with a parent who grew up in the depression era, we, we you and I were talking about this in, in as we were preparing for this podcast. Um, if you have a, if you grew up with a parent who, who grew up during the, the, um, the during the De great depression, well, that's what everybody during the Great Depression did was they they saved everything because everybody struggled. Everybody, you know, you didn't know when you were going to be able to get things again or and have things again. So they kind of had this mentality that you don't get rid of anything. You keep everything. And if you grow up with parents that do that, then you're going to be likely to do that as well. Right. And and there's something about this age where you want to, you, you know, you you tend to 55, 60, 65, you know you're losing control of some things. Right. 
So you kind of cling to what you have as a way of maintaining control. So over 55, you're vulnerable. And the other thing is, it doesn't matter what you're collecting. It doesn't matter what you're hoarding. Um, we see all these sad stories. There was a woman here in, in our county where she had, I don't know, hundreds, dozens of cats. She had like 27 or 30 cats or dogs, and they're all dying of disease and malnutrition and dehydration. But you just collect and collect and collect and collect, and you lose sight of it. And you eventually, because of the clutter, you eventually get to an unhygienic environment right. that you just can't keep up with it. And those that clutter is going to become residences for mice and rats and silverfish and roaches and every every other kind of vermin because you, you just can't clean it up and, and it becomes um, home for unwelcome visitors. The other thing is, so and and you need to remember that that as you collect, you're right. moving closer to an to a to an unhygienic, maybe even toxic environment. You talk about the black mold that you don't even realize. Right. The other thing is when you talk about a diagnosis, it's usually not when you talk about the diagnosis of hoarding disorder, it's usually not intentional. Right. Things have gotten out of hand and you're not doing it on purpose and you may not even recognize that you're doing it you may not even recognize it as a problem it's not an intentional thing of i have to have all this stuff that's hoarding when it's true hoarding disorder right so so some common indicators you know again strong attachment to things you know you you it, it's a you know it, it's a paper clip you know it's okay <laughs> you can you can throw it out you don't have to keep as many paper clips as you can. There, there's there's not a shortage, um, but this the strong uh, sort of un, unrealistic attachment to things. Um, again, a lot of anxiety or distress when when getting rid of things. You know, when if you ever work with someone who truly has a hoarding disorder, um, they 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 really really struggle with the idea of getting rid of anything. You know, you right. you, you bring in the trash bag. And you can see the distress and the anxiety and the hand wringing and everything just starting because it's it's really difficult to throw away anything. Most of us have heard of Marie Kondo. You, yeah, you've heard of Marie Kondo, right? If you've ever watched any of her programs, and I remember one that I watched, um, she really deals with people who are cluttered, mm -hmm. not hoarders. Okay, if you watch the hoarder show, you can see those people. They're so distressed that they just shut down. Right. I mean, they start to cry, they become inert, and they just can't let go of it. Okay. People who have clutter, uh, cluttering disorder, they're able to work through it with Marie Kondo, who's not a professional psychologist, she's an organizer. Um, they're able to get rid of stuff. This woman had she had a room one room in her house was just all christmas stuff the entire room was filled with christmas decorations she didn't use most of them but she could but she was able to get rid of them she was able to fill up the plastic bags and it was difficult but she was able to get rid of it so marie kondo does cluttering that's different from hoarding so with hoarding you have this anxiety that comes with getting rid of things but also you have trouble find whether you're cluttering or hoarding, you have trouble finding things. Right. Okay. The, the the black mold example I gave a minute ago was um, you know, the the person, the they had all of this stuff, but right. she couldn't find her social security card. She couldn't find <laughs> um, you know, they would lose their keys, they would lose all of these really important critical things that they really needed had no idea where those things were um that's a if problem you lose if you lose your you need your keys okay because you need your keys okay you need your purse you need your wallet if you're living in an environment where you're constantly losing stuff it may be that there's too much stuff in that environment right okay you shouldn't be losing your keys in your own apartment or in your own house. And right. if you are, it might be time to clean things out. Right. Uh, they, they, you know, how many table, how many surfaces do you have where your keys could be? Right. Well, if those surfaces are so cluttered that you can't find your keys, maybe, maybe you should think about decluttering. So if you have trouble finding things, 
Other thing, other signs are you avoid having visitors. You don't want anybody else to see the mess. Okay, yeah. so you avoid inviting people over, and then you start developing relationship problems, and eventually you begin to live in unsanitary conditions. Right. Um, it just is filthy. You can't clean a cluttered house. You right. can't dust. You can't do that deep cleaning that you need, and you get into other health and safety risks. So there are these common indicators of um, when when uh, cluttering and hoarding are starting to become a problem. Right. So but but it still is important about, to differentiate. Yeah. Exactly. That's exactly mm -hmm. where I was going. To differentiate between hoarding and clutter, you know, as right. we just talked about, you can tell that hoarding is gets into this pathological, you know, as we always talk about, it's not a disorder unless it causes some kind of dysfunction. And so with it, with hoarding disorder, mm -hmm. you're getting into this area of dysfunction because it's unhealthy, it's affecting you socially, it's affecting you emotionally. All of those things mm -hmm. suggest that we're getting into um, the realm of, of hoarding. Clutter, on the other right. hand, tends to be manageable. We, we see with, with people who have a lot of clutter, many times they're just they just may have difficulty organizing. They may have difficulty, you know, um, it, it does maybe get a little bit overwhelming. So they don't know where to get started, what to do, um, or how to deal with some of these things. They don't have a system in place for dealing with some of those things. But they know what's going on. They know they have a lot of clutter and they want to perhaps do something about it, but they just don't know how. That's very right. different than what we were just talking about with, with hoarding. Right. Clutter, it, the, the, the one that I like about it's manageable. OK, you know, you have a problem, you know, there's too much stuff mm -hmm. and you you can do something about it. You can throw stuff away. It might be difficult, but you can do it. Hoarding, on the other hand, you don't see that you have a problem. It's unintentional. Right. Um, hoarders become socially isolated. They reject treatment. They reject any suggestion that they should do anything about it. With cluttering, it's, yeah, I really should clean this out. Hey, I'll come and help you. We can get rid of all this crap in a few few hours. People with hoarding, no, 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 I don't want to touch anything. And hoarding requires probably professional intervention where cluttering doesn't. But I will tell you, if, if you really have a, a question, there's something called the clutter image rating scale. And this is one of the most useful things I've ever seen anywhere. If you want to know whether you have a problem or whether you need some help, they give the clutter image rating scale is photographs of a room. And the first photograph is everything is neat and clean. And each photograph is, is successively cluttered until you get to complete hoarding. Right? And there's about nine or 10 pictures that you can look at and say, well, I'm at number two or I'm at number six. Mm -hmm. If you get to number four, you probably need some help. Right. And it's a very clear way of deciding whether you're getting into trouble, whether you're cluttered or whether you're hoarding. And right. it's it's a really useful thing. So if you're concerned, uh, go to clutter image rating scale and you can decide for yourself whether you whether you need some professional intervention or whether uh -huh. you're hoarding or whether it's just clutter. Uh, absolutely. Now, we don't really know what causes hoarding no. um, or or clutter for that matter we don't really know what causes it outside of maybe some um, control issues or um you know senses of security um sentimental things are uh, purposes are, are often cited but one of the more interesting i think um explanations is related to something that we're very, very familiar with and that is attachment theory um, right. We usually think of attachment theory as it relates to our kids. You know, John right. Bowlby back in the 50s and, and on talked about attachment styles and, and talked about how mm -hmm. kids and um, attach to their parents early in life and what some of those attachments mean. And so we're going to talk a little bit about those because and, and how they can be associated with our tendency to hold on to things maybe that we really don't need to hold on to. Right. Yeah, there are four types of attachment, okay? Mm -hmm. The first one is anxious attachment. And as the name implies, there's, there's a fear of abandonment and you're overly depending, dependent on other people. And so what your things provide are security and stability. 
Um, and, and in a very real sense, we use material things to replace people right. because people, we don't trust them. We have a fear that they're going to leave us. Our things, our possessions aren't going to leave us. Right. We get to keep all that stuff. So if you have anxious attachment for some reason, things replace people and you hang on to them because of your fear of abandonment. Uh, absolutely. The, the the second type is um, avoidant attachment, and and this is um, again um, related to how we we see ourselves with other people. And so, with uh, avoidant attachment, we tend to distance uh, ourselves from others um, in order to maintain some independence. You know, I can take care of myself. I don't need because other people could harm me. They could hurt me. They could do something to to violate some boundary or something that I have. And so, once again. This is a situation where possessions will replace those re relationships and give a person this right. false sense of control, this false sense of self-sufficiency that they they see because they have yeah. these things. Um, and mm -hmm. like I said, with uh, anxious of, um, attachment, th these things aren't going to leave them. These things aren't going to hurt them. And so they can avoid people and they, they secure themselves with these things, these belongings. Yeah, when we talk about comorbidity, uh, if you have social avoidance, okay, you have, uh, and you're trying, you have that social anxiety, and you don't like to be around people, and you avoid being with other people, you distance yourself from other people. So your possessions replace relationships, okay? Mm -hmm. They're not, they're not going to do anything. They're not there, you don't have to worry about them, and you have this false sense of of control and self. I can I can exist. I don't need anybody else because I have my stuff. I have my things, and my things and I can have a perfectly happy existence. But the underlying problem is your avoidance. You have social anxiety disorder, and you're avoiding other people, so you replace relationships with things. That's a problem. And the next one, which is more difficult is disorganized attachment. That's right. So if you think about, maybe this the easiest way to think about disorganized is to, to think about a kid, you know, so you think about a, a, a toddler and, you know, if a, a toddler has an anxious avoidance um, or an anxious attachment, if mom separates from them, when, they, when mom comes back, the child is crying, the child is distressed and immediately wants mom to pick him or her up. And the kid like almost becomes consumed by mom. Like the kid gets as close to mom as possible, um, usually buries their head into their mom's neck or under her hair so that nobody can see them. They can't see anybody else, but they're there. The, the avoidant attachment, you know, mom comes, they're crying and upset. When mom comes back, they're angry with mom. So they they shun mom. They, they look away from her. They don't pay attention to her. The disorganized attachment, when the mom comes back, the child wants mom to pick them up, but then they're still angry with mom. They, they may look away from mom. They may, you know, um, turn their head away. They don't they don't seek the same type of reassurance and connection with mom like the anxious child, um, but they don't really do the um, the overt active avoidance that the avoidant attachment does. It's sort of a mixed, and that's why they call it disorganized attachment. It kind of is a combination of the two because um, they want the connection, they want mom to pick them up, but they don't want to connect to her. Right, and that's the best, I like that explanation is that, you want to be close, but you also push people away because you're you you have this fear of you have this, and so it's a combination of anxious attachment and avoidant attachment, and it's disorganized. And so what you do is you grab your stuff because it's not going to happen with your stuff. Your right. stuff is stable. It's like having a dog. You know, you can you can be mean to your dog; it's still going to love you. Um, and so that's what it is with your stuff. You collect stuff that's going to not not create these sort of uh, personal relationship issues. Right. If you have the fourth attachment, a secure attachment, and as you might expect, um, you're able to regulate. You can regulate your emotions and you can do it without material things. And you frequently hear people say, I don't, I don't need all this stuff. You know, I don't, I don't need to have a lot of stuff. I'm perfectly happy with five shirts and six pairs of pants and two pairs of shoes. 
I can do everything I want to do without it because you have a secure attachment to people. Right. You have you have people in your life that you can count on. So you don't need things to replace the people. Okay. Right. So yeah. and and I think another place where that comes in is the sentimentality. You know, we sometimes yes. you know, you know people sure. too that that they have an entire room that's sort of a a moratorium or like a a, a just a, a homage to uh, relatives who have passed away or something. And there's like this entire space full of things. Um, a person who has a secure attachment can maintain that emotional connectedness to an to a relative, even if that relative has passed, they can maintain that emotional relatedness or connectedness without having to have all of the belongings. I don't I don't need right. that you know, that ceramic squirrel that was on my grandmother's counter. I don't need that to remember how I felt about my grandmother, you know? Right. So we don't, they, they, they can get rid of some of those things without um, having the, the, the emotional damage that sometimes is felt by those other attachment styles. That's right. And, you, and that's what you have to be careful of, that you're not replacing people and relationships with objects. Okay. Right. That's, that's the deal. So what are the conclusions? Um, you can manage clutter on your own. Um, and most of us can, with help, you know, get somebody in there who doesn't have the sentimental value right. attached to it. Now get rid of that. Um, but if you want to manage your own, so you've done the clutter uh, image scale and you say, okay, I'm cluttering. I can get rid of this stuff. Take a look at what is your attachment style. Start with that. Say, what am I avoidant? Am I anxious? You know, know your attachment style. We have, did a podcast uh, earlier about knowing yourself. You know, if you're going to do self care, begin by knowing yourself. What is your attachment style? And then, second, what are things these? Uh, what are they providing you? Be honest and say, what is this stuff providing? Is it security? Is it money? You think you're going to? What you have to figure out. What does this stuff, what do these things provide to me? And why am I hanging on? Am I hanging on to them because I think I'm going to sell them someday? We call that future value. Right. Am I unable to make a decision? Am I afraid to get rid of it because I might use it someday? I might need it someday. Yeah. You have I, to think long and hard. Yeah. It, it's it's so interesting with some of these because like, I, I think of things that patients have said and and they'll say things like um well i keep it because man it was so this was what grandma loved this this was like her favorite ceramic squirrel she just loved that thing and so i keep it because she loved it right that hmm, you know if if you're accumulating so many things because somebody else loved it and so you feel this obligation i guess to hold on to it you know, if we're getting into that realm of cluttering, that's when you want to start calling some, you know, kind of sorting through some of that stuff and, and making some decisions. You know, if you want to keep one ceramic squirrel, it's fine. But if that keeps going on and on, and I keep this for this, and I keep this for this. Well, that squirrel is lonely. We need another squirrel. Because that squirrel is lonely. We need another one. Right. And I think, of, you know, and you, need, and you need to be careful. I have things, my father was a carpenter and he has built things uh, during his lifetime. He built us stuff. He's built us tables and carts and things. It's very difficult to get rid of that stuff because you feel like you're, by, you know, I understand that part. But when Amazon is delivering boxes to your porch because you have the 27th pair of shorts in your drawer, uh, there's no, there shouldn't be an emotional attachment to that. Okay, so there, so you can start with the stuff that's not sentimental value might be a stronger, might be more difficult to overcome that. A lot of the stuff would be very easy. I don't need to have 25 neckties. I simply don't. I mean, it's not, I don't need 12 belts. Okay. Mm -hmm. But most of us have multiples of everything in this, in these days of acquisition. Yeah. So figure out what you can get rid of. What question, and the other thing is, what question will be the decision maker? Is it, you know, some people say, if you haven't used it for six months, get rid of it. If it doesn't have any sentimental value, get rid of it. You have to decide what question works for you. Why are you hanging on to it? Right. So Absolutely. you can do that yourself with clutter. You might be a hoarder. You might be moving somewhere between cluttering and hoarding. And that's when you might need some professional intervention to dig a little bit deeper into these issues and say, okay, let's figure out something more systematic for you to work on.
Absolutely. And, and there's a variety of methods that are used in, in with hoarding um, to, to help with that. Things like cognitive behavioral therapy and, and motivational interviewing, um, mm-hmm. sometimes even family therapy to deal with, with some of that stuff. And, and in some ways, especially if there's also a lot of anxiety and things like that going on, medication can can be helpful. But mm-hmm. absolutely, if you're getting into that area of dysfunction, as we talked about, and it looks like it's more of a hoarding disorder than it is just clutter, that's where you may want to get some professional help. And and we should note, if it's even if it's just clutter, but you're having a hard time getting it organized, or you know, that that step or that piece that's missing is how to manage it, then you may want to talk to a professional for that as well. You know, we we often teach people how to how to think about organizing and how to create some systems and structures for doing that so that you can, you know, use it for not just the clutter, but you can then use it in other areas of your life as well. Right. Exactly. Yep. So I would start with that clutter image scale. It's really, really useful. It's nice color photographs. Figure out where you are. Uh, if you want to deal with it yourself, if not, give us a call and we can we can help you make that decision. And 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 if you need professional help, we can get you that too. Absolutely. Um, it's an important question, especially today. There's so much we have so much stuff, and as you say, <laughs> there's a there's a whole thing about storage sheds, storage units. You know what? Invest a lot of stuff. Invest in storage sheds. So all right, yeah. that's it for today. Until next time, stay happy, stay healthy, and forget to be afraid.